It was pardon, no grudging pardon, to be rescinded at leisure, or at best to be turned as a weapon against the sinner upon occasion, but reconciliation generous and complete, forgiveness, nay, oblivion of past hours. Bonaparte possessed the rare faculty of being able to forget at will, and his confidence, once restored, of ignoring crimes and faults, he had been pleased to overlook of wiping them out of his imperturbable memory. Not only could he forgive the faulty wife, he showed the rare virtue of magnanimity of her accomplices. He was never known to deprive any of them of life or liberty. He scorned to injure them, even in their fortunes. But it is recorded that on meeting any of them suddenly, he would turn very pale. The fault, he argued, lay not so much with these men as with himself. He should have kept the stricter watch over his wife. A man had been allowed to enter the harem, obeying the instincts of his sex. He had persuaded, and she had yielded, as it was her nature to yield. If the erring wife were no longer beloved, the husband would do well to repudiate, to cast her off, but he loves her still. Then what remains but to pardon and take her back to his heart? Reproaches will avail nothing in the face of accomplished facts. Bonaparte is disarmed. He bows to the inevitable. He is able to take things as he finds them and his fellow creatures as they are and ceases to exact from a woman the purity she has ceased to possess. But henceforth, he will be more vigilant and knowing or at any rate, believing he knows what woman's virtue and morality are worth, he will make it a fundamental rule that no man shall ever be alone with his wife on any pretext whatever. She shall be watched and guarded night and day. Such surveillance he takes henceforth to be the sole condition of marital safety. And if we find him occasionally relaxing this rule in the case of Josephine, by whom he no longer had any hopes of offspring, we shall see that it was rigorously enforced with his second wife. Josephine was triumphant. She had crushed the Bonapartes, who had not only opposed her marriage, but had planned and almost succeeded in bringing about its dissolution. A crowning gratification was the association of Napoleon with herself in her triumph over his brothers. The morning after the great scene and the reconciliation, Lucy, and the most eager advocate of the divorce, presented himself according to arrangement for an early interview and was received in Josephine's apartment, where Napoleon was still in bed. It is hardly necessary to speak of the debts, for after what she had brought himself to forgive, Bonaparte was not inclined to be severe about money transactions. I brew mayor the 21st. He paid off the 1,195,000 francs on the national property in the department of Dial. The estate served eventually is a dowry for Marie Adelaide called Adele, a natural daughter of the late Monsieur de Beauharnais. When Josephine married her on Fremere the eighth year eight to Francois Michel Augustin Le Comte, captain of infantry, who was appointed special receiver at Sarla on the occasion, he also paid the money owing on the purchase of Malmes on a comparative trifle of 225,000 francs, and he paid the 1,200,000 francs due to decorators and upholsters, or rather, after going into the accounts, deducting goods never delivered, and extortionate overcharges, he brought the sum total down to about half and compounded with the creditors for 600,000 francs. Here was indeed food for reflection. Had Josephine been capable of it, a husband who pays off two million francs of debts is a rara of ease, who may fairly claim certain concessions, and Josephine resolved to make them. Her superficial conduct, at any rate, gave no occasion to her enemies from this time. Until her divorce, she had, as she herself said, a wholesome fear of risking her position. To the Goyers, she gave substantial proof of her gratitude on the evening of Romero the 17th. 
She invited them to breakfast. The following morning, Goyer being unable to attend, she begged Madame Goyer to urge her husband's acceptance of a prominent post in the new government. Goyer, austere as ever, refused it indignantly. But when, after holding sulkily aloof for two years, he came to the first consul for a place, Josephine obtained for him the post to commissary general at Amsterdam, a position so much to his taste that he held it for ten years and would no doubt have retained it till his his death, but for the suppression of the office in 1810, he is said to have refused the offer of transfer to New York after this, but he accepted a comfortable pension, which was continued to him under the Restoration. He maintained his pose of virtuous Republican, however, to the last, and was buried by his expressed desire without religious ceremony. Chapter 7, Grissini. Bonaparte had found it possible to forgive. He had even forced himself to forget, but his attitude towards Josephine in the year eight was very different to that of his first meeting with her. When the possession of the woman and the lady flattered his inexperience of love and of the world intoxicated his awakening senses and appealed with irresistible force to his newly developed temperament, his liaison with Madame Forrest had given him a taste for the freshness of youth, the incomparable bloom of 18, and comparisons unfavorable to Josephine could not but present themselves. He had learned the charm of novelty, and henceforth he neither wished nor intended to be a faithful husband. The part he would fain have assigned to Josephine in the future was that of friend rather than mistress, of confidant rather than wife. He sought in her the tender counselor to whom in quiet evening hours he might confide the thoughts that agitated him and to whom he might turn for guidance in the usages of a society with which he had had no time to become familiar. The affectionate nurse who would tend him in illness with almost maternal care, watch over him, pity and console him, on whose lap he might lay his aching head, and whose slender hands would soothe its pain with caresses, as if he were a child once more. And yet there were still to be times, for she could never wholly lose her charm in his eyes, when she would be the wife, and even the mistress, but a mistress with whom he could be perfectly at his ease, who accepted his melancholy or his gaiety with the same apparent equability who never showed signs of fatigue, but was always ready for journeys, expeditions, perpetual movement from place to place, who was always willing to wait and never kept him waiting, who without his own feverish activity contentedly took part in all his occupations, sat beside him when he drove his foreign hand, joined in the romping games he affected, followed him in the hunt or accompanied him to the theater with the same soft smile on her lips, the same sweetness in her voice, in his political schemes, a more important part was to serve for Josephine. The nation he had determined to reconstruct lacked, he considered, two of its essential elements, the nobility and the clergy. The latter he undertook to conciliate. He looked to Josephine to rally the former. Ignorant of the mystic hierarchy which governed the French society of the monarchy, the minute gradations distinguishing one set from another, the impassable gulfs dividing them, Napoleon proposed to deal with this society in the mass. Josephine, he argued, had belonged to it. She could restore it. She she would be a fit and natural intermediary between himself and the emigrants, courtiers, and nobles, all who had formed part of the old order. She should dispense favors and benefactions, inquire into wrongs, repair injustices, and gradually detach from the opposing camp all those deserters whom Napoleon wished to bring back into France. Later on, she would be the link between the remnant of the old regime and the representatives of the new. The part thus marked out for her was a brilliant and dignified one. Josephine had many of the qualities essential to its success, ease of manner, courtesy, elegance. She had to a remarkable degree the gift of well-chosen and appropriate speech, generosity, a charming grace in conferring favors or bestowing gifts of politeness tinged with respectful deference towards a guest and an adaptability of character which made her at home in every circle she entered as a fact. She was far from possessing the interest and influence in the society of the past ascribed to her by Napoleon. The intimacies she 
she had formed since the revolution were of little use and might indeed have materially damaged the new government had not the first consul exacted their discontinuance. Her position was consequently a very isolated one at first, but as Bonaparte's power increased, social obstacles seemed to disappear. Fine distinctions were no longer insisted on, as new ambitions sprang into being both in the emigrant colony and in Paris. There were many eager to establish some chance connection with the Bowernade or Tasher's distant kinships and alliances who there to ignore were now ostentatiously proclaimed old servants and underlings of every grade were used as stepping stones and soon all the needy and important survivors of the former order were setting in a steady stream either towards the yellow saloon of the Tuileries or the stuccoed reception rooms of Malmaison it must not be supposed however that this current flowed towards Josephine as a sign of the Tashers or the Bowernay, her prestige was due to the fact that Bonaparte had made her the partner of his fortunes. Her attraction lay in her position as the wife of Bonaparte, a possible intermediary with the master. The ambitious would have gathered round her, whatever had been her name, her origin, or her past history. For was she not the satellite of that planet to whom they looked for light? Josephine, however, perhaps honestly enough, attributed the result to her own personality. She persuaded Bonaparte that she was rendering him the most important services, and strange to say, he believed it implicitly. Confident that he himself had conquered the clergy, he was easily convinced that his wife had won over the nobility. What woman might not have been content with such a measure of honors and gratified by the performance of duties so important and so varied? Had not the consul some right to expected Josephine, bearing in mind her own lapses, and grateful for the generosity that had condoned them, realizing with advancing years the disparity of age between herself and her husband, and judging leniently of weaknesses from which she herself had not been exempt, would have shown some indulgence to fancies that left her position and Bonaparte's affection for her untouched, fancies which the consul's dread of scandal and his sense of what was due to himself combined to veil in decorous secrecy. Such a view of the situation was far enough from Josephine's mind, not that she was moved by a renewal of passion for her husband, nor that admiration and gratitude had awakened in her an affection so tender and entire that she could not restrain her jealousy. Her thoughts were all of herself, of her position. She imagined that Bonaparte's gradual detachment from her would culminate in her divorce. Hence, she lived in a state of perpetual terror, spying upon him, and pain others to spy upon him, abasing herself by the most unworthy devices, wearying him by stormy scenes, tears, hysterics, confiding her suspicions to anyone who would listen, and in default of evidence, inventing misdemeanors which she declared she had herself witnessed and was ready to attest on oath. The consul's first infidelities were nevertheless of slight importance a day or two after his triumphal entry into Milan, a concert was improvised on Prairie the 14th or 15th, in which the two most famous of Italian artistes, Marchese and Grassini, took part. Grassini was 27. She was born at Varese in 1773, and her beauty was no longer what it had been two years before, when in that very city she'd used her utmost art to attract Bonaparte and win him from Josephine. Her figure had become somewhat heavy and overabundant, her face always of a massive cast with strongly marked features, jet black eyebrows, and quantities of dark hair had lost its refinement. She was still beautiful, but with the beauty to be met with in every street in Italy, brilliant eyes, a rich olive skin, and an air of southern warmth and passion that her actual temperament is said to have by no means justified. She had had scores of lovers, not from mercenary motives, for she was far from venal, but in consequence of misconceptions acted upon in all sincerity on the other side. There was not one among them whom she had failed to reclaim an angel at first, but her honeymoons rarely lasted beyond the first quarter. Though Grassini's beauty was ready on the wane, her voice was at its best, and the purity and expressive power of her singing was incomparable. She was not a great musician and had no very logical conception of the principles of her art, but she herself was 
an embodiment of that art, her voice a contralto of extraordinary sweetness and pathos, pure and equal throughout its compass, was in itself a system of harmony. To hear her was to listen, not to a singer, but to amuse. Her phrasing was inimitable. As an interpreter of serious opera, she was without a rival in opera bouffe. She was less successful, and none of her contemporaries came within measurable distance of her in breadth and grandeur of tragic sentiment, or in the magnetic power with which she could thrill a whole audience and hold it spellbound. Bonaparte throughout his life was peculiarly sensitive to music, especially that of the human voice of all the arts. Music was the only one for which he had a personal taste and predilection. The rest he encouraged, partly for policy, partly out of his passion for the grandiose. In his yearning for immortality, but in music, he found a real enjoyment. He loved it for its own sake, and for the sensations it awoke in him. It calmed his nerves, glorified his daydreams, soothed his melancholy, and warmed his heart.